All right, well, this morning we come to Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council. And what I'd like to do is read the text. I'm, I'm not really going to make um, reference to it um, uh, again in, in, the, uh, in the passage just to save time because it is a rather lengthy passage. But let's begin by reading uh, the text, uh, chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you were circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing through both Phoenicia and Samaria describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them cleansing their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. All the people kept silent, and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they had stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. With this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After these things, I will return, and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. Therefore, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. For Moses, from ancient generations, has in every city those who preach him, since he is read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas called Barsabas and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And they sent this letter by them. The apostles and the brethren who were elders To the brethren in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia who are from the Gentiles, greetings. Since we have heard that some of our number, to whom we gave no instruction, have disturbed you with their words, unsettling your souls, it seemed good to us, having become of one mind, to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. 
So when they were sent away, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Judas and Silas, also being prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brethren uh, with a lengthy message. Let me just stop there. Okay, so this morning, again, we have before us the Jerusalem Council. Let's uh, try to see what it is that's going on here, what the issues are at stake, what the conclusions are, and what these four things are actually referring to. Well, last time, as you know, we saw the end of the first missionary journey and how Paul and Barnabas re returned to Antioch and told the brethren there about all that the Lord had done through them and how he graciously was bringing the Gentiles into his kingdom, basically pointing out that the gospel which had already reached uh, Judea and Samaria was now going out to the ends of the earth and reaching the nations, as the Lord said it would. But of course, as the Gentiles uh, became a part of the church, uh, the Jewish believers began to have questions about what this means and how things were done before and how they should be done now. Now, some of these issues that we struggle with uh, of understanding the relationship between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, uh, you know, we still struggle with those questions today. It shouldn't surprise us that they were struggling with them then. You know, like, what's changed now that we've moved from the Old Covenant uh, into the New? You know, what, what is different and what remains the same? A lot of different views have, have been you know, presented in the church. Uh, some think that um, it means the Old Testament is obsolete. That we should really tear it from our Bibles and, and use exclusively the New Testament. As a matter of fact, I think the... Um, the college that I, I went to may have fallen into that category. Uh, others believe we, we should use the Old Testament only to illustrate uh, the new. And I think um, that, that, again, goes with the first view of, of you know, the, the Old Testament really doesn't have any relevance uh, beyond illustrating certain things. And maybe we can use it to show how the Lord prophesied and predicted that these things were going to take place, and that adds more authority uh, to the New Testament, but still others, such as ourselves, see that the Old Testament was the Bible, and is the Bible, right, that the apostles used during their ministry, that, that Jesus used to prove their doctrine, and to teach and equip the saints. And it's, it's still God's Word today, though we understand certain parts of it have been fulfilled and that we no longer need to keep certain parts of it, such as the ceremonial law, which is what we're going to see. But there's still a great deal of it that does apply to us. So again, we need to understand that. Well, again, the point is that as this transition is taking place, there's a lot of questions that are being raised. This morning, we see the church wrestling with perhaps the most important question. Maybe not perhaps, it is the most important question. And it's this. Is it enough for the Gentiles simply to trust Jesus to be saved? The same thing could be asked of the Jews. Or do they first need to become Jews, to be circumcised, and to keep the ceremonial law in the same way the Gentiles in the Old Covenant were converted to Judaism? Let's remember that we have a lot of history here, a lot of uh, track record, you know, up to this point. Anyone who joined themselves, any Gentile, anyone from outside of the Jewish covenant community that joined themselves to the Lord had to be circumcised and had to observe this law. Corresponding question that we might ask ourselves today is uh, we often find ourselves, as I mentioned before, in the service in our weaker moments asking the same kind of question. Is there something more, something more that I need? beyond faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do I need to be baptized? Is that a part of my salvation? Can I not be saved without it? Um, do I need to be good enough before the Lord will accept me? Well, we need to understand that what the council is dealing with this morning is the gospel itself. Just how are we justified and reconciled to God? Is it by grace through faith alone, received as a gift from God? Or is it by God's grace, but we must add works 
of our own. Well, Luke tells us in our passage that some men from the Jerusalem church went down to Antioch. Now again, uh, Antioch being actually pretty far north from Jerusalem, we wouldn't characterize it as going down, we would call it going up. But remember that to the Jewish mind, Jerusalem being built on a hill, everything is down from Jerusalem, wherever you travel. So they went down to the Antioch church, and we've seen from a later part of this text exactly who these people are. They weren't just random Jews from Judea. These were believing Jews, perhaps even Pharisees, that were a part of the Jerusalem church. Some of our number, they said, who have come and have taught you uh, disturbing things. Well, these were teaching the new Gentile converts that they needed something more, something more than Jesus. They also had to be circumcised, and I want you to notice, circumcised in order to be saved. And again, I think what's in mind here is that they had to become Jews like the rest of the Jews, join the old covenant community before they could be saved by the Jewish Messiah. Now, we need to understand, I think, first of all, in untangling this, that there is nothing wrong with circumcision or even being circumcised. Remember, Paul had Timothy circumcised because his father was a Jew. His, actually, his mother was a Jew. His father was a Greek. And Paul wanted to make sure that as he took Timothy with him that Timothy wouldn't stumble others. So he had Timothy circumcised. As a matter of fact, today in our own culture, I looked it up, the vast majority of male children within the first week after birth are also circumcised, not for any religious reason, of course, but just simply circumcised. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem here is when you add circumcision to the work that Jesus did for our justification. When you look to circumcision as something that is necessary, meritorious perhaps, in order to be accepted by God. Now, as this idea develops, we've already read what Paul had to say about this later in Galatians chapter 5. He said to receive circumcision as a condition of salvation is to fall from grace and to be cut off from Christ, cut off. This work, or any work that we might add, destroys the principle of grace. Remember, grace by definition is free. It is the exact opposite of works. Again, let me remind you what Paul writes in Romans 11, verse 6. But if it, that is justification, is by grace, if it's a free gift, it is no longer on the basis of works. It's no longer earned. Otherwise, grace or the freeness of this gift is no longer grace. It's no longer free. Now it's something we have to earn. Now again, the same thing could be said of baptism. Do we need to be baptized to be saved? Or any other good work? Do I need to do good works? Do I need to keep up a certain level of obedience? Do all of us need to before the Lord will accept us? Well, of course not. Salvation is a gift from God. You cannot earn a gift. Christ is the one who has earned it. It has been earned. It has been paid for. But Jesus paid for it. And it's something that God now gives to us freely. Now, Paul and Barnabas, apparently in this uh, debate that, that uh, arose, gave their best arguments. But apparently, they weren't enough to settle the matter. You know, no matter how good your arguments are, even if they're true and valid and bulletproof, so to speak, there's always going to be those who are going to reject them, who are going to see it differently. Ultimately, it's in the Lord's hands as to whether He's going to enlighten the mind and allow you to see the truth. Now, I want you to notice here that this was Paul who was arguing. This is the one who was called by Christ. This is the one who is an apostle. He was not able to settle this debate. Uh, I want you to notice that apostles did not have monolithic authority. Even they were not looked at as a source of infallible teaching. You know, everything had to be proven by the Scriptures, or we might also add, by plain reason, as we're going to see at the council. By the way, do those words sound familiar? Unless you can prove to me 
from Scripture or by evident reason. I cannot betray my conscience. Didn't Martin Luther say something similar to the Roman church who was claiming infallible authority? Well, again, the apostles appealed to Scripture. When the Antioch church couldn't settle the issue, they decided, notice, to take it back, to take the matter back to its source. Why did they go to Jerusalem with the issue? Well, it's because that's where the problem originated. That, that's at least one of the reasons. So they sent Paul and Barnabas along with some of the brothers to the apostles and the elders at Jerusalem. The other reason, of course, is that the church in Jerusalem was at that time the central authority for the entire church. This is where the apostles were headquartered. The Lord allowed this structure to stay together seemingly until the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, though some were martyred perhaps in the interim, because he wanted this central authority to hold the entire church together until the scriptures were complete and the church was established. After that, there has really not been any other central authority outside of the scriptures themselves. Now, on their way, they visited other churches, telling uh, them what the Lord had done uh, among the Gentiles. Uh, again, I think as they're thinking of the issue, they're thinking about, again, as they're going to bring up exactly what the Lord did among the, the Gentiles. This is something strengthening their case. God is saving Gentiles apart from circumcision, apart from, you know, the keeping of the ceremonial law. But the Jewish believers, as they heard what the Lord was doing, they were rejoicing. Interestingly, you know, the Jews hated Gentiles as we know, and yet the Lord had so changed the hearts of these Jews that they were accepting the Gentiles as brethren in the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember what we heard uh, Sinclair Ferguson say about how the gospel, as it were, makes all people into one new family. There's no longer Jew and Gentile, and there's no longer, as it were, you know, your family and my family, but rather we're all one family in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as family members, when one member of the family suffers, we all suffer, the Bible says. And when one rejoices, we all rejoice. And so as these Gentiles are coming into the church, again, who were formerly considered to be the, the worst among all mankind, they're now rejoicing that these are their brothers and sisters in the Lord. The gospel unifies. It brings us all into one household, the household of God. But when they arrived in Jerusalem, they also shared these things with the apostles and the elders, what the Lord had done, that they might know what God was doing among the Gentiles, but also again to build their case. I mean, think about what's on their minds as they come here. Think about their purpose for coming. How are we to relate to the Gentiles? Well, this is what the Lord has been doing among the Gentiles again, apart from these things. But there's maybe another reason why they said that. It may have been to provoke the response that we see happen next. It, it immediately brings the matter to a head. Some of the Pharisees who believed began to argue that these Jewish believers not only needed to be circumcised, but they also needed to obey the Mosaic law. Now, again, I believe they're referring to the ceremonial law there. There's no question that they must obey the moral law. That's not really a questionable thing. Remember, the blessing of the new covenant is having the law of God, the moral commandments written upon our hearts. He gives us the Holy Spirit to give to us the desire to live according to the law of love. The only thing that's in question are the traditions and the ceremonies, not the moral law. Now, it seems likely that these Pharisees were from the same group that had sent the teachers to Antioch, and, and of course, we call them Judaizers. Some of them apparently remained so afterwards, but perhaps all of those at this particular meeting give up that, you know, that view because it does say later they all became of one mind. But at least at this point, there's still some ambiguity. They do not know what the right way is. At least some of them don't. Well, now that the issue was on the table, what the gospel actually says, the apostles and elders knew it needed to be settled because the future of the church was at stake. So they came together 
not only to look into God's Word, again, unless it can be proven by Scripture, but also by the evidence, by reason, you know, evident reason. And that is what he had been doing among the Gentiles apart from circumcision and apart from the ceremonial law. After they had debated for the matter for some time, and again, I want you to notice there's a debate going on, even though we have this centralization of power, even though we have several apostles who are here, there's still a debate, and the debate has to do with what do the Scriptures say? They had to argue and prove their points from the Word, and again, from the evidence that the Lord had given. Well, Peter, first of all, presents a very convincing argument, and this is evident, you know, evidence or evident reason. He says, and I'll just paraphrase, remember a short time ago when the Lord gave me that vision about the, uh, you know, the sheet and the unclean animals and how he told me to rise and slay and eat, and then afterwards how he sent me to Cornelius' house and how I preached the gospel to them and how the Lord granted them his mercy and they believed, and how he showed that he had accepted them, he gave them his Holy Spirit. Remember that these men were not Jews. These men were Gentiles. These men were God-fearers, but they were not circumcised. That's what it means to be a God-fearer. You know, you adopt the God of Israel, you accept his ways, you worship him according to his will, but you hate circumcision and you refuse to be circumcised. So these men were saved even though they were not circumcised, and yet God accepted them when they believed. Now, if that's the case, why would He now add these requirements, especially something so burdensome as the ceremonial law, which He says, neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? Okay, again, uh, I'll submit to you that Peter must have been speaking here about the ceremonial law. That was the burden, to keep up that whole system of sacrifices. And I mean, you can imagine how much work that was. But let's add to that the fact that John tells us very plainly in, in 1 John 5 that the moral law is not a burden to the believer. And the reason why it isn't is because in the new birth, again, with the Spirit of God working within us, He gives us the desire to keep that law. He to give, By giving us the desire to love God and to love our neighbor, and when you do something you want to do, that is never a burden. So this is a ceremonial law. Now, Peter further points out that the Jews themselves were also saved in the same way, by God's grace, received by faith and not by works. So here we have uh, argument one. Peter says, these Gentiles and even yourselves were saved apart from these things. Secondly, Paul and Barnabas step up to the plate and they add their testimony. They reminded the assembly how the Lord was working through them, how He had done many signs and wonders among the Gentiles and how many of them had believed and been saved, again, without circumcision, without the ceremonial law. And then finally, James, the, the Lord's brother. Uh, clearly, the early leader of the Jerusalem church points to the, the former testimony, and by the way, it's a little bit confusing here because he, he says Simeon has just pointed out to us, and it's like, well, well who's Simeon? Well, Simeon is, is Peter. It's another form of the word Simon, Simon Peter, and that is Peter's name, Simon, and he was called Peter by, by Christ. He pointed to Peter's testimony, and he said that this is exactly what God said he was going to do in the Old Testament prophets that he was going to return. That is, he was going to come to Israel again in his mercy. He was going to rebuild the tabernacle of David that, has, that had fallen, which means he was going to restore the Davidic line to, to the kingship. And he did that when he raised up Jesus Christ. And the reason he was going to do this was so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. All the Gentiles who were called by his name, his elect, his chosen ones, the ones that Jesus referred to in John chapter 10 as the sheep who are not of this fold, whom must, or who must be brought into that fold, or those who are of the faith of Abraham who are uncircumcised. So James' conclusion was this, that they not trouble the Gentiles who were turning to the Lord by placing this burden on their shoulders, 
but rather encourage them not to do four things because these four things would offend the Jews who lived around them. Okay, the Jews around them, he says, Moses has preached in every city every Sabbath. And what he meant by that is the Jews are being indoctrinated with, with Mosaic teaching every week, and they're going to be very sensitive to these issues. So these are four things we do not want you to do. So what are uh, these four things? The first is that they not eat foods sacrificed to idols, Secondly, that they abstain from fornication. Thirdly, that they not eat what is strangled or blood. Now, what, what does James mean by these things? Well, I think three of them are fairly clear. Okay. The first one, by the way, I, I think we should most likely argue that all the things that he has in view here are matters of Christian liberty in the New Covenant. Now, I realize that sounds strange with regard to fornication, so we have to, in this case, understand fornication uh, according to its meaning, but it, with a different application. But let me just suggest, first of all, that I think all of these things really are a matter of Christian liberty that the council is telling the Gentiles to abstain from so that they do not offend the Jews, because otherwise, why wouldn't they give them all the commandments and say, keep all of these things and don't, so you don't offend the Jews? They already knew they needed to do that. The question is, what else can they do to, to sort of not offend those who are engaging in the ceremonial system, okay? Now, the first one is clearly a matter of Christian liberty, foods offered to idols. Paul tells the Corinthians, remember, that they may eat meat that is sacrificed to an idol. And maybe it doesn't sound like something you want to do or I want to do, but, but in the Corinthian, you know, in, in Corinth, this was something fairly common. And it wouldn't have been so strange for those Gentiles who had become Christians still to get some of their meat from the meat market, which comes from the temple. They could do that as long as it didn't cause a weaker brother to stumble. Now, the council is adding here, if it offends the Jews, if it creates a roadblock to their acceptance of the gospel, which it inevitably will give up that particular right, that particular liberty for the sake of the Jews so they don't get in an uproar and you give Christ a bad name. Now, the third and the fourth obviously also have to do with the ceremonial law, which in the new covenant becomes a matter of Christian liberty, although that may be a question we have yet in, in our minds, but hopefully that will be cleared up. Eating what is strangled and blood. You know, meat from an, from a, an animal that was strangled still contained blood, and that's the reason why Jews would need it, because all blood belongs to the Lord. Now, <clears throat> is this something that we have to observe now that we are no longer, on the di un no, no longer under the Mosaic dietary restrictions? Well, let me, um, let me give you a quotation from someone we all love and respect that I think will perhaps help clear it up. Sinclair Ferguson. Sinclair Ferguson writes this from his own experience in addressing this very issue of uh, the Mosaic dietary law and how it applies to blood in particular. He said, it was years ago now, but I still remember the discussion. I was making my way out of our church building sometime after the morning service had ended and was surprised to find a small group of people still engaged in vigorous conversation. One of them turned and said to me, can Christians eat black pudding? To the uninitiated in the mysteries of Scottish high-class cuisine, it should perhaps be said that black pudding is not haggis. It is a sausage made of blood and suet, sometimes with flour or meal. It seems a trivial question. Why the vigorous debate? Because, of course, of the Old Testament's regulations about <clears throat> eating blood. Although, as far as I am aware, no theological dictionary contains an entry under B for the black pudding controversy, this unusual discussion raised some most basic hermeneutical and theological issues. How is the Old Testament related to the New? How is the law of Moses related to the gospel of Jesus Christ? How should a Christian exercise freedom in Christ? The Council of Jerusalem, described in Acts 15, sought to answer such practical questions faced by the early Christians. 
as they wrestled with how to enjoy freedom from the Mosaic administration without becoming stumbling blocks to Jewish people. Well, what was the answer? Dr. Ferguson goes on to say this, since we don't have time to read the entire article. He says, we are free in Christ from the Mosaic dietary laws. Christ has pronounced all food clean. We may eat black pudding after all. Not that you'd want to eat it, but you have the liberty to eat it. Now, remember um, when Jesus said in Mark 7, it's not what, comes, uh, not what goes into uh, the mouth that defiles the man, but what comes out of his mouth, because what goes into his mouth goes into his stomach and is eliminated. What comes out of his mouth comes from his heart. But then there's that parathetical statement, thus he declared all foods clean. And I think we have the same kind of thing going on when the sheet is lowered and the Lord says, rise, Peter, slay and eat. These Mosaic dietary laws were meant to keep the Israelites separate from other people. And now that the middle wall of partition was being broken down and he was bringing the people together into one new man, these requirements were no longer necessary. So this is the conclusion that Ferguson comes to with regard to what James is saying. You do not need to exercise your liberty in order to enjoy it. Indeed, Paul elsewhere asks some very penetrating questions of those who insist on exercising their liberty whatever the circumstances. Does this really build up others? Is this really liberating you? Or has it actually begun to enslave you? Basically, if you can't give it up, for the sake of somebody's eternal well-being, then hasn't that liberty actually become something that has you in bondage? You're no longer in liberty. Now you're bound to that particular thing, whatever it may be. The council was saying that the Gentiles, the council was saying that we should be willing to give up certain freedoms that we might not offend others in the hope of bringing them to the Savior, whether it's a Jew, in which case we have to observe certain things, or other people, you know, whatever their scruples may happen to be. Paul says, I become all things to all men, that I may win some to Christ. But now we still have one more requirement, don't we? What about that second one, that they abstain from fornication? Now, I think our first inclination, as it is generally by the church, is to understand this is a moral issue, an application of the seventh commandment that they keep themselves from sexual relationships outside of marriage. That's at least one application of the word fornication. Another is adultery. Another would be bestiality, sodomy. Um, there are many other things because fornication is a very broad rubric. Now, the fact that this one stipulation appears to be a moral one is why some Christians believe, and by the way, the college that I went to believed this, that they meant to substitute this for the Ten Commandments. Basically, the Ten Commandments are no longer binding, but you, you need to do these four things. Well, that, that is problematic, isn't it? Because we've already seen that the moral law is what the Spirit of God writes on our hearts in the New Covenant to give us the power to become like the Lord Jesus who obeyed those commandments perfectly, uh, to love God and to love our neighbor. Now, it certainly is not loving to commit sexual sin with our neighbor, and fornication is certainly excluded by the Ten Commandments and by the law of love, but is that the only one that remains in force? We also need to ask the question, would it be loving God not to have Him as our God, not to worship Him as He commands us, to break the promises that we make to Him? to break his Sabbaths by not giving him the day, the Lord's day, completely to him? Would it be loving our neighbor to disregard their lawful authority, to honor our parents, to honor those in, in power around us, to injure or to murder them, to steal what belongs to them, to falsely accuse them, or to covet what belongs to them? Well, you see, if you say the Ten Commandments are no longer in force, you're essentially saying that that's okay, but obviously that can't be okay with just fornication being the only thing that we are now told not to do, okay? Now, if James is not then reducing the Ten Commandments down to just simply one moral commandment, why does he single this one out? That, that's really the question. Well, some have suggested it's because this was a very common sin among the Gentiles, but... 
I'll wager breaking the Sabbath was another. And I imagine they also broke the others as well. Is, are those not going to be offensive to the Jews? Now, F.F. F. F., yeah, F. F. Bruce had a slightly different perspective. And F.F. F. Bruce is some, someone I think we've heard of quite a bit, a highly respected biblical uh, scholar of the last century. He believed that what James was singling out was that the Gentiles not violate or that they observe the laws of consanguinity, which I know sounds like a fancy term, but basically it means not to marry too close, too closely within your immediate family, you know, not marrying blood relations because the Gentiles typically did do that. And that's something the Jews would find particularly offensive. And uh, we still do in our society today. But the problem with that is that's still a moral issue isn't it? Because the laws of consanguinity still apply. You know, we're not to marry a sister. We're not to marry a mother, you know, or a father or somebody who's too closely related to us. We need to marry more distant relationships. So there's still another possibility, and I think it's the better of the three, is that he was using the word more, more broadly to perhaps refer to... Um, Another form of fornication, perhaps we would call it that. Remember that fornication and adultery is not simply committed uh, physically. It can also be committed spiritually. And the idea here would be that, that what James is actually giving are two groups of two requirements. I don't know if you noticed the second two were very similar, weren't they? Things strangled and blood. And the issue with both was blood. The second one is eating things sacrificed to idols and fornication. Now, what if that fornication really has to do with idolatry? That's what the suggestion is here, that this would be, the requirement would be not only not to eat things sacrificed to idols, but to stay away from other things that are also associated with idolatry that the Jews would consider to be unclean. Now, again, I think that that is a better view because fornication is already covered by the Ten Commandments. It doesn't really need to be reemphasized. If it did, then James would have said, then keep the Ten Commandments. So he's singling this, this out, and this would also make it, I think, if we understood it more clearly, a non-moral issue like the others and a matter of Christian liberty that they were able to give up for the sake of others. So I, I'm suggesting that I think that it needs to fall in that ballpark somehow, realizing at the same time, I am in no way saying, nor is James, that fornication is not an issue, okay? It is something forbidden, and we need to stay away from it. But as far as what it means in this context, it's probably relating to idolatry. Now, the council agreed with James' conclusion. They composed a letter to that effect. They sent it out through Judas and Silas, along with Paul and Barnabas, to Antioch, so that all the churches that had been affected would be able to, to see it, and it was read and explained. Now, those who heard it rejoiced because of its encouragements. You know, they, the, these people were coming, you know, again, these Judaizers, and were trying to lay this, this huge burden on them, and now this burden has been lifted. All I have to do is trust in Jesus and serve Him. Not that that's going to be an easy thing, serving the Lord, but I don't have to keep grinding through this system. Can you imagine if we had to keep up the ceremonial system? It would probably take up most of our time, and we wouldn't be able to do what the Lord is calling us to do. So they rejoiced, and we should rejoice as well. You know, we don't have to bring sacrificial animals to the, to the church. All we have to do is trust in the work of Christ. Um, the council restated the truth of the gospel. Jesus has done it all. We only need to trust him. It refuted the Judaizers. We don't need to be circumcised. We don't need to keep the ceremonial law. But it also emphasized a couple of things, and we don't want to miss this. Not only did they, of course, clear up what the gospel actually is, and we need to make sure we understand it, but they also told us how to use our Christian liberty. We can choose to be circumcised or not circumcised. We can choose to keep the Jewish, the Jewish traditions or not as long as we don't trust in them for our justification, okay? Because there's nothing sinful about those things in and of themselves. It's only when you 
include it in the things that make you acceptable to God. Okay, so it, it told us that there is a, a, such a thing as Christian liberty, but it also showed us how we are to use our Christian freedom, not just to please ourselves, not to offend others, but rather to become servants to others that we might bring them to salvation through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, let's, let's not forget this council was not just for those Gentile believers who lived a long time ago. This council was for us, and it taught us some very important things that we need to remember. So may the Lord help us to remember them. Let, let's uh, take a moment, shall we, and let's bow in prayer. Let's ask the Lord that He might apply these things to us. Thank <clears throat> you.